and we're moving on to chapter 28 and 29 the last four two of the last four chapters of our book so here we go how can they expect us to get ready in such a short time crazy plane tickets and permission slips paperwork and practice practice every day for close to two weeks study every evening with mrs v words cities states countries capitals oceans rivers colors diseases weather numbers dates animals kings and queens birds and insects wars and presidents and planets authors generals laws quotations measurements equations definitions my head has been spinning non-stop with facts and figures but i'm ready now our team is ready mr d kept his promise the six highest scores from all our practice rounds were announced at the last practice session a few days ago of course just like the other kids i had been keeping a mental tally of everybody's points so i was pretty sure i'd be one of the on-air contestants not an alternate mr dimming almost glowed with anticipation as he made the announcement he paced nervously a little more and the man would have been dancing. Here we go, he said. I feel like I need a drum roll or something. Read the list, please, Connor shouted impatiently. Mr. Dimming said slowly, the six members of the championship Spalding Street Elementary School quiz team are... He paused. I thought Connor was going to throw something at him. Rose, Connor, Melody... Elena, Rodney, and Molly. Claire and Amanda will be our alternates. I'm an alternate, Claire gasped. Molly beat you by two points, Claire, Mr. D explained. But you still get to come with us and cheer us on and tour the city. But it was me who helped her study, Claire said, outrage in her voice. This is so not fair. I just shook my head and smiled a little bit. There's so much Claire doesn't know about stuff not being fair. Molly looked smug and not at all sorry. Her mother came to pick her up and practice was over. The competition is tomorrow, Thursday evening. Assuming we win, we will have the Good Morning America appearance on Friday, followed by a trip to the White House. More sightseeing in DC is planned for Saturday. Then we come home on Sunday. On Monday, hopefully, we'll return to school as national champions with that trophy. So tonight we pack. I've never been on a trip away from home before, so we will have some serious planning to do. I feel crazy excited, crazy nervous. Dad bought me a bright red suitcase with wheels. It smells like the inside of a new car. Touching it makes me smile. Mom and I went shopping yesterday something we don't get to do much anymore. She let me choose a couple of new outfits with jeans. None of those practical baggy sweatsuits for this trip. As we rolled down the mall, we passed a card shop. I had a brainstorm and tapped out on my board. Go in, get card, please. For whom? Mom asked as we wheeled in there. Catherine, I typed, to thank her for helping me get ready. How very grown up of you, Mom said, and clearly pleased. One for Mrs. V, too, I tapped out. Absolutely. The card we found for Mrs. V could not have been more perfect. The front was completely covered with hundreds of oranges, except for one blue one in the middle. Inside it said, you're one in a million. Thanks. She'll love it, Mom said. For Catherine, I picked out a card. It showed a desk full of computers and MP3 players and video games and a young woman connected to all of them with earphones. It read, glad you're always there to plug into me. Thanks for all you do. You couldn't have designed those better yourself, mom said as she paid for the cards. Yep, pretty perfect. Around seven o'clock, the doorbell rings. It's Mrs. V coming over to help with the final packing preparations. She and mom make a great team. I've made a checklist according to Mr. Dimming's suggestions, Mom says. Black shirt, white plows for the competition. Check. Mrs. V says that she neatly folds two pieces into my suitcase. Check. 
Penny mimics. Extra white blouse just in case, Mom says. Great idea, Mrs. V replies, nodding. Mom carefully folds in two more shirts and my favorite pair of jeans. Comfortable outfits for sightseeing in Washington. Spending money for souvenirs, sunglasses, and camera. Check, 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 Mrs. V repeats. Pajamas, toothbrush, deodorant, hair clips, all there. A warm jacket, no telling what March weather will be. Check, Penny cries. Power pack for Meditalker, extra batteries, tissues, and wipes. Got it. Umbrella? For you or Melody, Mrs. V laughs. Do you have your bag packed? Yeah, I'm just about ready. I'm nervous too, Mom pauses. You are the best, Violet. I know Penny will be safe with you while we're gone. And butterscotch, I interrupt. They both laugh. Mom continues, frankly, without you there is no way that Melody would be packing for this trip. Get card, Mom. I reach in my hand on my side, but I can barely touch the end of my book bag holding on my chair. Mom reaches into her bag and pulls out the envelope and sets it on my tray. I push it towards Mrs. V. She opens it, reads it, and then squeezes me so hard. I can hardly catch my breath. This one's going on the refrigerator door, she says quietly. I want to look at it every single day. She busies herself with the dusting off pair of shoes and have another that have never taken a step. I'm a little scared, I admit. Nonsense, Mellow Yellow, Mrs. V tells me. I fully expect you to see you on Good Morning America with that 10-foot-high trophy. That would be awesome, I type. Now, tell me once more, Mrs. V says to Mom, what time does the plane leave tomorrow? Penny, take Melody's underwear off your head, you silly girl. Mom checks her papers. Plane leaves at noon. That means we should leave no later than 9 to get to the airport by 10. Check all check-ins. Make sure her wheelchair is properly taken care of and such. And then we can relax until it's time to board the plane. Mrs. V, v scratches her head. I wonder why they choose the noon flight. That will get you to Washington, D.C. around 2. The competition starts at 7. That's cutting it a little close. Mr. Dimming told us that the hotel has a late check-in policy. The TV studio is just across the street from the hotel, so we'll be fine. As mom closes and zips my suitcase, I feel tears come into my eyes. I can't believe this is happening. In just one day, I will be in Washington, D.C. on national television. I pray I won't screw up. I want to call Rose and see if she's nervous, too. I want to ask her what she'll wear to the White House. Suppose we get to meet the First Lady. Now, that would be the bomb. I want to know if we'll be sitting near each other on the plane. I want to be like all the other girls. I don't sleep well that night. In the morning, Mom gets me bathed and dressed and fed in record time while Dad gets Penny ready. Go see plane, she asks repeatedly. Fly wee! Dad says as we as he flies her around the room in his arms, and she loves it. We head outside, and Mrs. V hurries over, camera in hand. She snaps pictures of me getting strapped in, the suitcase being loaded, and my brave and hopeful victory smile. Then she does it all over again with Dad's camcorder. Now, we'll never be able to forget this morning. Penny darts about, chasing butterscotch, running in circles around the car which has been washed and shined. Mom, dressed in a cool denim suit, surprisingly, a pair of late-style Nikes, loads our bags in the car, and we're totally ready to go by 8.45. Dad takes Butterscotch back into the house, then locks the front door on the way out. All set, he asks. Let's do it, Mom yells. Even Penny can feel the excitement. She claps her hands. I can't stop grinning. Even though. I know. We have plenty of time. I keep wanting Dad to drive faster. I'm so afraid we'll miss the plane or that we forgot my ticket or that I'll throw up and we'll have to go back home. At the airport garage, we have no trouble finding a row of empty handicapped parking spaces. We unload me, my chair, our bags, and Penny and Doodle. Mrs. V snaps more photos. It seems like hours, but in minutes, we're at the check-in gate. 
Mrs. V pushes me. Mom carries Penny. Dad pulls a cartload of luggage with doodle. It's 10 o'clock on the dot. Hi, Mom says cheerfully to the uninformed lady at the desk. We're here to check in for the noon flight to Washington, D.C. She hands the lady our tickets. The noon flight? The woman responds with a frown. She types and clicks, purses her lips, and types some more. Finally, she looks up. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that flight has been canceled. We have had loads of cancellations today. A late winter snowstorm in the Northeast has caused backups all over. Canceled? My stomach starts to gurgle. Snow? Mom's voice sounds thick. But the weather here is sunny and clear. They've got five inches on the ground in Boston already. And more is predicted from the afternoon farther south. The FAA won't let plans take off in weather like that. So our whole system gets gummed up. Planes due to arrive here and then return eastward got canceled, meaning our afternoon flights can't depart. It's complicated. Sorry. The desk agent continues to type rapid, rapidly. She tells mom, I can get you and your daughter on the next direct flight out. However, it leaves at 7.23 p.m. and we'll get you to Washington, D.C. at 9.07 the Weather Service has predicted that the storm will have fizzled by then, so we can start getting folks there when they need to be. Actually, tomorrow it will be all rain. My heart is thudding now. Would you like me to rebook you now? She smiles cheerfully. She doesn't get it. But the competition starts at 7, Mom mumbles weakly. Excuse me? I didn't hear you, the desk agent says. I, I can't breathe. Mom speaks a little louder. What about the rest of our group? We're traveling together, a group of school children, a quiz team, actually. They've also booked on this flight. We've got a competition this evening. Oh, I remember those kids. They were here early this morning. Great group, so polite and well-mannered. They told me about the competition and the huge trophy they might be bringing home. They came early, Mom croaks. It seems they all went to breakfast together, then came straight here. It's a good thing they did, too, or they wouldn't have gotten out. Where are they? Mom asks. Oh, they got switched to a 9 o'clock flight, the last eastbound plane to get out before the flights started getting canceled. They had to run down to the gate, but they made it just in time. I made sure of it. She looks down at her computer. Yep, that flight left about an hour ago. They're gone? Mom whispers. I feel like I'm going to choke. Are you and your family going to D.C. to cheer them on? The woman asks. She still didn't get it. No, my daughter is on the team, Mom explains. We must get to Washington. Is there another flight? Perhaps another airline? The woman looks at me and blinks. She's on the... She starts to ask, but then she catches herself, returns her gaze to her monitor, and begins typing furiously once more. I can hear her fingernails as they click on the keys. Dad places both hands on the ticket counter and leans in towards the agent. I've never seen him so angry. How could this happen? Shouldn't we have been notified that the flight was canceled? We try, sir, but it's not always possible, the lady replies, sounding truly sorry. We do always advise passengers to call ahead and check their flight status, but this was the trip of a lifetime. You can't possibly understand how important this is to my daughter. I squeeze my eyes shut. Stupid elevator. Music floats from the tiny airport speakers. I hear no beautiful colors. I smell no lovely aromas. All I can see is the darkness behind my eyeballs. I'm really, really sorry, sir, the lady says. What about a connecting flight? We must get here to Washington this afternoon. The woman types and clicks for what seems like hours. Finally, she looks up. There are no other flights to D.C. on any other carrier, sir, nonstop or otherwise. That weather system has grounded everything. There will be nothing until later this evening. I'm so sorry, she whispers. I open my eyes because they're filling with tears. Dad walks away from the ticket counter. He faces scrunched into tight wrinkles. Then, without warning, he smashes his fist into the wall right next to where I'm sitting. I jerk my head up. I know that had to hurt. Oh, I should have done that, he admits, holding one fist in the other.
But if I could have smashed my fist against the wall, I would have as well. Mrs. V looks from dad to me. I don't understand how this could have happened either, she says to mom. Shouldn't someone from the quiz team have called you? Her voice crush bricks. The teacher, perhaps? Maybe there wasn't time, mom said helplessly. At least that is what I hope. Surely they, surely they would have left, they wouldn't have left her behind on purpose. I still have not taken one deep breath. I really do apologize, ma'am, the gate attendant finally says. I even checked airports in nearby cities. There are no flights out of this area until this evening. I have plenty of seats on our seven o'clock flight. If you'd like me to book you, no thank you, mom says quietly. It's too late. The entire airport feels like a vacuum to me. No sound, no voices, no air. Mom walks slowly towards me. I sit there in my new blue and white outfit with new matching tennis shoes. New to me, to my new shiny red suitcase, feeling very, very stupid and angry. How could they do this to me and helpless? I hate feeling like this. Like when I was a little girl and got stuck on my back and like a stupid tur turtle, there was nothing I could do, nothing. How long does it take to drive to DC, Mrs. V asks. I don't even look up. I know the answer. 10 hours at the very least, dad replies, his voice soft. Go fly airplane, Penny asks. No fly today, dad says, touching her gently on the head with his good hand. Mom rolls me over to a bench on the other side of the check-in area. She kneels down in front of me. She's crying. I don't think I'll ever breathe again. Mom hugs me. It's going to be okay, sweetie. You're still the best, the smartest, the most wonderful girl in the world. Somehow, we're going to get over this. No, I won't. Mrs. V wipes her eyes as well. She sits on the bench and takes both of my hands in hers. Oh, baby girl, I know this is hard, but there is just no way to get you to Washington. I just sit there. The morning started out like crystal but the day has turned to broken glass. Chapter 29. When we get home, I ask my mother to put me in bed. I refuse to eat lunch. I try to sleep, but quiz questions and why questions keep flying in my head. Why didn't they call me? Why didn't they tell me about breakfast? Why can't I be like everyone else? I finally cry into my pillow. Butterscotch nudges me with her nose, but I ignore her. They left me on purpose. How could they do that? They left me on purpose. I feel like stomping on something, stomping and stomping and stomping. That makes me even crazier because I can't even do that. I can't even get mad like a normal kid. Penny peeks into my room then. When she sees I'm awake, she climbs onto my bed and snuggles close to me. She smells like watermelon bubble bath. She tries to count my fingers and tries to count her own, but all she knows is one, two, three, five. So she says that over and over. Then she tries to teach Doodle to count. Two, Doodle, two. I feel myself relaxing a tiny bit. Oh, here you are, Penny. Dad says in the doorway. Are you making Dee Dee happy? Dee Dee, good girl, she tells Daddy. Yes, she is. The very best, Dad agrees. You okay, Melody? He asks as he comes over to stroke my hair. I nod. I point to Dad's left wrist, which is wrapped in an ace bandage. Yeah, it hurts, he says. That was a dumb thing to do, but I guess it made me feel better. I nod again. He lifts Penny from my bed with his right arm. Ready for a snack, Miss Penny, he asks her. Hot dogs, she demands. Do you want me to fix you something, Melody, he asks me. I'm not hungry. I shake my head and point to the clock. Maybe later, Dad says. I smile at him, and he quietly leaves the room with my sister. The phone rings. I hear Mom say, oh, hello, Mr. Dimming. 
She walks quickly into the room, portable phone in her ear, her palms so tight around the receiver, I can see the veins on the top of her hand. No, I don't understand, Mom says curtly. Why weren't we called? She listens for him for a moment, then bursts out angrily. We could have easily been at the airport an hour earlier. We could have been there at dawn. She's almost shouting. Do you know how much this has devastated my daughter? A pause. Yes, I'm aware she's probably the brightest person on the team. Was. The word is was. There is no is. Mom paused and listened again. You'll make it up to her? You gotta be kidding. Mom hangs up on him and flings the phone into the corner. She wipes her eyes, pulls a tissue from the box on my desk, and sits down heavily in the chair next to my bed. I listen to her blow her nose, and then I turn over. Oh, Melody, if I could only make your hurt go away, she said plain, plaintively. I blink at my own tears. She pulls me onto her lap. It isn't the snuggly fit it used to be, but it feels good. She rocks me humming softly, and I finally fall asleep to the rhythm of her heartbeat. What an amazing two chapters, boys and girls. I can't believe that they left and went to breakfast and then left for Washington without telling Melody. Unbelievable. There will be a question to follow up with this, and I'm hoping that you take your time with it and you answer honestly and tell me how you feel. Hope you enjoyed those two chapters.